Welcome to Media Path. I am Louise Palanker. And I'm Fritz Coleman. Awesome. Today, our path takes us through the 12 quality years of My Three Sons and beyond with our guests, Stanley and Barry Livingston. But first, Fritz and I have been scouring the media landscape to bring you the finest of viewing and reading suggestions. So, Fritz. Okay, well, this is time important, and it's really uh, important just in a general sense. My first offer is Tulsa's Buried Truth. This is an ABC News investigation, part of their Soul of the Nation series podcast. They do uh, as part of ABC News documentaries. Today is the closing day, 100 years later, of one of the most horrible racial events in the history of the United States. Actually, there are a few documentaries about this incident that can be streamed. The one I saw is the ABC News Soul of the Nation series called Tulsa's Buried Truth. Today marks the exact 100th anniversary of this notorious race conflict, the Tulsa Race Massacre. It took place over this weekend in 1921, May 31st through today, June 1st. It started in a way very similar to the Emmett Till incident in Mississippi in 1955. A 19-year-old African-American shoeshine person was accused of attacking a 17-year-old white female elevator operator in Tulsa. The boy was taken into custody, put in a city jail. Word spread quickly And a rumor started that a band of white men was headed for the city jail to lynch this young man. And as a result, a group of 75 black men showed up to protect the boy. Shots were fired and all hell broke loose. This was an area of Tulsa called Greenwood, which was known as Black Wall Street because of all the enormously successful African-American businesses in the area. And it was said that it wasn't just Black Wall Street. It was Black Main Street because it was considered the greatest example anywhere in the United States to that point of African-Americans living the promises of the American dream. But in this incidence, there were gun battles on the ground. And even, this is hard to fathom, bombs dropped on the neighborhood by private aircraft. Finally, on June 1st, martial law was declared. The National Guard was deployed. When all was said and done, 300 black people lost their lives, 800 people taken to hospitals, 35 square blocks of Tulsa destroyed. This is a piece of American history that few people had ever heard of. I had never heard of this incident, and I love American history. It doesn't appear in history books, particularly in schools. There were people quoted in this movie that were born and raised in Tulsa who had never heard about this event in their city. Not until 75 years later, 1996, was a bipartisan government commission set up to investigate the event. The commission decided reparations should be paid to the descendants of the victims, so the descendants were given scholarships. Money was set aside for economic development in the Greenwood area, and a memorial park in the town was created. But it was a stark example, Wheezy, of the selective history often taught in our school system. I couldn't believe I'd never heard of this, and the most horrible racial event in the history of the United States. Well, I'm kind of fascinated by revisionist history and the uh, incentive to rewrite history. So, for example, you know, you hear about the Confederate statues that weren't built until the the 1930s mm-hmm. or something because they want to somehow justify their point of view in the first place and remind black people to be afraid. And by covering up this or not even allowing the people of Tulsa to imagine that it happened or Holocaust deniers, like, you know, what is in it for these people? Is it that, you know, because you would think racists would be really proud, like, look what we did. We tore this up. Mm-hmm. But instead, they kind of want to behave even even the insurrection at the Capitol they kind of want to behave as if this didn't happen so that somehow they can do it again I, w- yeah. what are your thoughts that was the sad irony in Tulsa because once this event was over white and black residents that lived in close proximity had to live with one another with this 800 pound elephant hanging over their heads for the rest of their lives really uh, a horrible circumstance well I, I'm hoping that here at the hundredth uh, anniversary, and I think uh, President Biden is there today, and he gave a beautiful speech that I heard uh, a little bit of before we came in here today to record the show. You know, he's giving voice to this, and this is something that school kids from this point forward will know and understand. Absolutely. Is my turn to talk about something? It is. Okay, Do so it. I watched something, Fritz. 
You always do. Yeah, I watched it. It's called The Me You Can't See. This is Apple streaming, Apple Plus. And in this groundbreaking and important Apple TV series, Oprah Winfrey and Prince Harry guide discussions about mental health and emotional well-being while opening up about their own often fraught journeys towards mental wellness. Participants in the series include Lady Gaga, Glenn Close, and Robin Williams' son, Zach, along with successful athletes and inspiring citizens who share their stories. This show is the most open and raw conversation about mental health I have ever experienced. We just don't all fully understand the extent of people's suffering, and it's so important to destigmatize a highly misunderstood health concern and give hope to viewers who face similar battles. It's just so hard to imagine that your thoughts are not always able to heal your thoughts. But that's just not how the brain works, and we need to better understand it and accept help when we truly need it. Especially Prince Harry. You know, we think royals are royals and they're on that plane. And But wow, they all, and if you watch The Crown, you get a sense of that. They all have um, their own issues, especially psychological well, see, issues. Well, see, the royal family remind me of the Amish in that it's very insular and it's like our problems are going to stay in here. Mm-hmm. Like no one else is going to know about mm-hmm. if someone gets raped, we'll handle it ourselves. And, and so... You know, people, Whatever problems. I know I'm exactly saying, what you're saying. You know, they, they don't really want any, they don't want to ask for help because they don't want anyone to know that there's anything wrong. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that is twisted. That's what I got they, out of the crown. Every yeah. single one of those people. And I'm sure there are people that would, oh, if I could be a princess or if I could be a queen. You'd be a lovely princess. Oh my God. Well, I've, you yeah. know, for a, a couple of nights I've done that, but, but, uh, <laughs> but, but every single character in that show the crown I'm talking about now, uh, pointing out that every single uh, member of that family, the Windsors, is a lonely, singular human being with literally no connection to anybody else. It's it's depressing as hell. And they and I'm not surprised they have problems. And Harry is the first to admit his. And he jumped himself out of the cult. Yeah, <laughs> he did. Pretty brave. What else you got, Fritz? I got the Panama Papers. Ooh, I love that. Did you see it? Yeah. Oh, man. This is on Prime Video and Hulu. A few years ago, 11.5 million encrypted confidential documents that were property of a Panama-based law firm were leaked. The law firm was Mossack Fonseca. Now, Mossack Fonseca specialized in finding offshore tax shelters for wealthy people and other groups with shady intent. It exposed 214,000 tax havens, most of them offshore, involving 200 different countries. Now, the whistleblower, the person that released the documents, was never identified. After the leak, 100 investigative journalists from around the world worked simultaneously to expose the setup. They all published their findings on the same day, and it became a firestorm around the world. Suits were filed. Threats were made. One journalist was killed. Wealthy people at all levers, uh, levels were implicated. Vladimir Putin, Syrian President Bashir al-Assad, Prime Minister David Cameron lost his job. He ultimately resigned. The Prime Minister of Iceland resigned, all the way down to cocaine traffickers and global soccer stars. Even former Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin makes a brief appearance. But uh, of course, he oh, seems like such a good guy. Oh, man. He, he's questioned by Congress about his offshore holdings. It's one of the first combined efforts by global journalists. It, it's a look at the monstrous, insurmountable problem of offshore tax shelters, a topic that became uh, really important during President Trump's administration because he gave controversial tax breaks to the top 100 percent or top one percent and uh, corporations as well. And and it's a look at duplicitous politicians who publicly proclaim we have to do something about tax cheats only to be implicated in exactly the same activities. Fascinating document. Hashtag projection. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. So I have two uh, books here before I introduce our guest, Fritz. Is is that going to work for you? It's going to work great for me. Okay, awesome. So the first book is called The Paris Library. It's by Janet Skeslian Charles. This book is a library reads pick and it's been named a most anticipated book of the year by Library Journal and Goodreads. Based on the true World War II story of the heroic librarians at the American Library in Paris, this is an unforgettable story of romance, friendship, family, and the power of literature to hold us together. 
The book toggles back and forth between Paris, just before the World War II occupation by the Germans, where the bookish and scrappy Odile lands her dream job at the Paris Library. And it toggles to a small town in Montana in the 80s, where a lost and lonely girl named Lily befriends the mysterious lady next door, Odile. Odile helps Lily see how easily the betrayed can slip into becoming the betrayer and how we can best value, honor, and protect our friendships and our integrity. So, Fritz, I read another book that you might find interesting. It's called The Importance of Being Ernie by Barry Livingston. One of the great titles of all books. Yes, but not to be confused with The Importance of Being Ernie and Bert, A Best Friend's Guide to Life by Bert and Ernie. Uh -oh. Now, I would like to point out that the Sesame Street book came out in 2019, clearly lifting their title off Barry's book, which was released in 2011. Are lawsuits pending, Barry? <laughs> yes, I've got uh, some real high-powered attorneys working on this. Yeah, I would, I would imagine I mean, so. What can you do? It's the way of the world. Yeah. And uh, Oscar Wilde, I'm, I'm sure, is is still trying to find <laughs> me and, and get in touch to <laughs> That's right. rip him off. Uh, so, but nonetheless, uh, it was a great title. I wish I could take credit for it. And um, hopefully the book is as good as the title. Well, it is. So Barry's book recounts fascinating anecdotes of the unique childhood spent on sets with Fred McMurray, Ozzie and Harriet, Lucille Ball, and Dick Van Dyke. Barry has ridden in a limousine with Elvis, attempted to upstage Opie, and shot a Super Bowl beer commercial with Brad Pitt. Fifty years later, Barry is still going strong with feature film roles opposite Adam Sandler and Robert Downey Jr. This most excellent read explores how one child star beat the odds and survived the dark side of the Hollywood dream factory. With charm, wit, and determination and big horn rim glasses, this is the importance of being Ernie. So we're going to introduce our guests, Stanley Livingston and Barry Livingston, who are in fact not coincidentally in possession of the same last name like in Duran Duran. Which mm -hmm. where there's three guys named Taylor, and they're not related. These two are you guys are brothers, right? That's Who would have known? Yeah, we just so, found that out a week ago. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, know. the power of ancestry.com, and also that he had the next door down in the hallway back home. So Barry Livingston is an American television and film actor known for his role as Ernie Douglas on the television series My Three Sons. He is the younger brother of actor, director, producer Stanley Livingston, who played Ernie's older brother Chip on the show. He is also known for War Dogs, Argo, and Jersey Boys. Stanley Livingston is an actor and producer known for My Three Sons, Attack of the 60-Foot Centerfolds, and The Aftermath. Along with Fred McMurray, Stan is the only actor who performed on My Three Sons for all its 12 seasons. So, Stan, you went from how old to how old uh, on the show? Uh, well, we did the pilot in 1959, so I was eight turning on nine, and that was about t almost 23 when it was over. So was this so, weird sense of, like, I don't know who I am outside of this show? No, uh, primarily because my parents had made the decision, uh, even though, you know, we were child actors, uh, the entire time, our entire youthful career, we returned to public school every year and got beat up every day mm -hmm. by students who were jealous that we were on TV. Um, but it wasn't quite that bad. But our parents thought, you know, you should be with real people. That's where you're going to live your life when you grow up, and you better learn to deal with them. Mm -hmm. Were you born and raised in Los Angeles? Born at Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital oh. on Vermont. Mm -hmm. And wow. we were uh, raised in Hollywood right off of, uh, well, well I, I, get, I get to tell you. Will you know, Cox in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for boomers. We're there, Formosa Avenue before that, and uh, then we moved to the Valley in 1963 to Studio City. That's why you have your feet on the ground. You're from the Valley. That's why. <laughs> well, but you we know, didn't like moving to the Valley, all our friends that we grew up with lived uh, in Hollywood. So yeah. every day after school, I'd have to take a bus to go visit them. Oh, well, you know, for, for we boomers uh, who, who were obsessed with your show. Uh, they didn't understand how TV really worked in the magic wall between TV people and real people. We felt like you guys were related to us. And, and you know, the Nelsons on Ozzy and Harriet. And I felt so connected to this show. And another reason why it was so ultimately important to me was that my father, when the show would start, would do that foot thing. He wore wingtips. <laughs> and he would do that. 
<laughs> and he would do it every time and and treat it like it was a joke he never told, and he did it for years. Did his hands make letters go in and out? No, oh. no but he did oh, the foot. Absolutely annoying, your dad. <laughs> oh, no, no. But it showed, uh, I, I, I mean, it was, it was it got into such, his head, such sure. a part of our <laughs> Did he do lives. it smoking a pipe? That's the question. <laughs> yes, he did do it smoking a pipe. Multitasking, yes. He did smoke a pipe. So oh. what I'm wondering is, were your characters based on your actual personalities? Uh, uh, well, you know, once they got to know us a little bit, I think the scripts got tailored to some degree to not only our personalities, but our interests. You know, um, when I was younger, I wasn't interested in girls, I was interested in baseball. You know, the girl thing didn't come along till later, or skateboards or horses or, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, they would talk to us and find out what we were interested in mm -hmm. and then somehow work a script around that. Cool. Barry, you were uh, you made an interesting transition on the show because you started out as a neighbor and then right. ended up being an adopted brother. Describe how that worked. Um, yeah, you know, it was an it was an odd thing because prior to my three sons, we both were on the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. And uh, Stan was sort of the main Ozzie's main dude to go to the malt shop with. And then <laughs> he got the gig on my three sons. And so I sort of slid into that slot in the in the Nelson's you you know universe, just the kid who would go with Ozzy. So um, you know I was already acting, and I, I had done a bunch of films, My Six Loves with Debbie Reynolds and Aaron Boy, and and I spent a lot of time on the set of My Three Sons as well, just hanging out. My brother, you know, was cheap babysitting. My mother would just drop me <laughs> off there, so they knew I was acting. Uh, they were aware of other things I was doing. And and I was just that, you know, that brother in the bullpen that when uh, when Tim Considine decided to leave the show, um, you know, I, I was asked to come on as the friend next door and Chip's friend, really. And um, that's how I kind of, you know, kind of snuck into the back door into, into becoming a brother. Was it helpful? Do you think that the par the producers knew your parents? And a lot of times when you're casting children, you, want, you really want great parents because they're going to be around. And, and well, my, you know, my parents were great because they hated being on a set. <laughs> it's the most boring thing in the world to sit there and really do nothing. You know, your way, your kids are doing all the work. You're just there, you know, making sure it's a safe environment. And, and it, it was. Yeah. So there was no sweat there. So my, my mom very early on figured this is not for me. So we had a guardian. A uh, lady named June Cole, whose son was Tommy Cole, one ah. of the original Mouseketeers. So she was very set savvy and was more than willing to be our guardian on the set uh, and was, you know, both Stan and, and, and my guardian for the, all the, the 12 years that we were on. And she kind of, you know, picked us up in the morning, dropped us off in the evening. It, it was it worked out well. So Stan, fess up. I, I mean, were you at all... Uh... Uh, angry when, oh, here comes my brother. I can't have my stardom alone. Now they have to hire my brother. He's got to follow me around all day. <laughs> no, actually the opposite. Um, because for the first three years of the show, I was immersed in a world of adults. You know, everybody on that set was a crew guy or a director or producer. They're all in their 30s, 40s, somewhere, I think, in their 90s. <laughs> and uh, so occasionally we would have a child actor. They'd have a scene in the school and there'd be a bunch of kids there that day. So it was kind of a relief for me to be around other kids. And then it was you know, great when Barry started working on the show as, uh, you know, kind of a neighbor. And he'd be in the classroom scenes and he'd work for the day. But then when Tim left, it was even but not that I wanted to see Tim go, but, you know, he wanted to see what life had to offer. And the show was called My Three Sons and we needed a third son in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> and since there's no nepotism in show business, I said, well, what about this guy over here? Well, and we, Barry had already been on the show. No time, so they felt he was a great actor and brought him in. And now I had a friend on the set every day. Yeah, yeah, and he was I, such a distinct know, he was my, character. The best agent I've ever had, my brother. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Were your parents in show business? My, Oblique my, face. <laughs> you know, in a, in a roundabout way, my dad owned uh, burlesque theaters in uh, in Baltimore. Wow. And my mother, as we found out later, she was a fan dancer. Nice. Which, you know, wow. Gypsy Rose lead tradition of uh, burlesque. 
And so um, it was always when we were growing up, oh, she was a dancer. And I always kind of thought, well, you know, you know, the both the ballet, the Metropolitan Opera. But uh, no, it, it was more of a, a, a fan dance with a feather and a boa and running around stage. Half, well, I half like naked. this story so, better. Yes, we were sort of tangentially involved in show business. But but that, yeah, their end of the world had nothing to do with getting into television. Well, I we've heard it's kind of legendary how Fred McMurray would film all of his scenes in one in one, you know, rapid fire stretch. And then and then he'd bounce. And then you guys would film the rest of the scenes that he wasn't going to be in. So how confusing was that for you? And how did producers keep your hair and clothing consistent and keep you guys from growing? It's a continuity person. Yeah, continuity. But it's a tricky. We had a great continuity yeah. person. Her name was Jean Belcher, and she didn't let anything get by her. A few times things got by. And I mean, where they had problems with me when I was about 13, I think within a three-month period, I had a growing spurt of about four inches. So <laughs> wow, that was a big deal. And what if your I voice changes? Anymore. Yeah. yeah, I think that the guys, you know, we were kids, so you just roll with whatever. It's just the way we worked. And you'd work out of 10 episodes a day, meaning you'd have 10 different storylines that you'd have to. Wow. You know, was, it, it wasn't like, you know, Dr. Zhivago with this complicated thing. <laughs> it kind of was about the skateboard or this one was about a date or something, you know, learning to drive. So it wasn't real complicated. But but nonetheless, uh, we did have to know the older guys, Bill Frawley, William Demarest, you know, they were old school. And then back in the day, they were used to doing two pages a day and then they'd off to Musa Franks. You know, <laughs> this was a little different way of working for them because, uh, you you know, they do 10, 12 pages a day, which is quite a quite a chunk of work. And and again, the, the storylines would be kind of, you know, you'd have to know what what was happening in each one to keep it straight. So it was a challenge for them. Not, yeah. not so Weezy, you actually. brought up Fred McMurray. I have yeah. a question about Fred McMurray because I was such a fan. This had to be Honestly, one of the most versatile actors. I mean, he did Double Indemnity and The Apartment, where he was this menacing character. But he also did The Absent-Minded Professor and Shaggy Dog. Range. He really had range. H how was he to work with? Was he patient with young people? He was, you know, what you saw pretty much on My Three Cents, I think, is who he really was. Wow. Uh, that show was kind of created for him. Uh, he and his wife, June Haver, adopted twins and he didn't really want to go out of town anymore doing movies and be gone for three months at a pop. So my three sons offered him a, you know, a job that you could drive to work in the morning at eight o'clock and be home by six o'clock, have your weekends free, have your summers off and you get to be with your kids. And it's it, a Shirley well, Jones story. Uh, it offered him a boatload of money as well. Too. There you go. Yes. <laughs> That's nice and yeah. ownership of the show. And legend has it. He kept all the money and invested well. He invested well, and I, I guess I'm not talking out of, hopefully I'm not talking out of school too much, but uh, I, I wrote a song, if I can find it on YouTube, called The Ballad of, of Fred McMurray, <laughs> and uh, and it's kind of, I think, a cute little song, but I went to talk to Julie, one of his daughters. I said, you know, I'm writing the song, and I'd like to get your blessing, and if you can tell me anything about Fred that I didn't know, and I found out quite a bit, because Fred was an extremely private man. Hmm. Very conservative. I, we all knew that. But but uh, she told me that he lost his entire fortune uh, and he had a fortune. He was known to be one of the wealthiest men in Hollywood through investments in real estate, through all the stock that Disney gave him to do all those movies. He, they couldn't meet his regular salary, so they gave him stock. But he had a, a business manager and um the story I was told was it was the same guy that John Wayne had. Whoa. And Wayne warned McMurray, get out, get away from this guy, that he's no good. And, uh, you know, McMurray didn't do that. And according to Julie, she said he he lost a lot of money. Most wow. of his fortune was, was I, I knew squandered June, away. June by this. was one of the founders of Child Help USA, yes, which was a yes. nonprofit organization that I was also involved with and used to go out and do their Inland Empire fundraiser every year where she and all the women who, I think there was three of them, yeah. Uh, and Federson's wife, Don Federson. Yes, my yes. Who was the producer of the show, him. right? And I heard the, well, I, I heard, now I heard the third act of the story, which is he lost everything he accumulated. But apparently when he was flush with money, he bought huge acreage in San Bernardino County, just miles and miles of property he owned out there at one time. Uh, well, and, and San Bernardino, but in Westwood in, in all of the ritzier areas of L.A. And then he owned he owned uh, 
you know, huge parcels in Montana and Wyoming, a cattle ranch, apparently. Wow. Um, California, too. Um, you know, I think they sold because it, it was in wine country. They sold that to the Gallo wine people. Holy cow. There is a McMurray wine. It's a very, very good wine, in fact. But it, it has it's only because it's on his property. That used to be his property. He had nothing to do with it. Oh, wow. It seemed yeah. like, you know, when I was researching and reminding myself, you know, I, I grew up on this show was on for 12 years. So it, it, it I didn't know what life was like without the show either, you know, with you guys. So between you guys and Leave it to Beaver and a few other shows, it seemed like maybe they were writing more for boys because there weren't any women on the production teams that, that was easier for them to write for for boys well some of the shows had boys and girls and to give you a piece of trivia mm -hmm. before my three sons was to come my my three sons don Federson had approached the lennon sisters mm -hmm. and it was going to be my four daughters oh wow you know? the and problem is you can never tell those girls apart that was well, the problem and they didn't want to they didn't want to go anywhere so they changed it to boys and <laughs> eventually became uh, my three sons yeah, because when you watch the writing, I mean, maybe it's just me as a as a woman now looking back on the shows, you know, because you can see these as much of these shows as you want to now. Used to be you had to wait for a rerun or something. Now you can right. just dive in and you can watch, you know, you can binge it and really get your fill. But, you know, between your show and Leave it to Beaver, sometimes the women are written a little goofy or the girls are l written a little silly or a little manipulative. Yeah. And it seems like it's a male. I think that was just time and place. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah and that's how women best. were written then. Yeah. Father Knows Best had two pretty strong leads. You know, it was, it was Eleanor Donahue and Lauren Chapin. So, you know, and Billy Gray. So there's three kids, but two of them were, were girls. Yeah, that's right. You're right. It, it did. But, but the novelty of my three sons was the fact that it was an all male household mm -hmm. there was no nannies there was no ann b davis it was supposedly uh you know a a family the household in dis disarray it wasn't a june cleaver kind of managing the laundry and the cooking and everything the house you're right seen. it was ahead of and its that, time a single father raising three sons which is yeah and I, a grandfather we had yeah. william frawley yeah yeah and i think what Add to the mix what resonated with with america was it it was a household that was not perfect that it was the dog and this was the uh the brainchild of a the, uh, director at the time in the first year peter tewksbury and he set the tone it's very important when you're doing a series to have somebody who sets the tone that the show followed for the next 12 years but it was okay when you're coming down the staircase he would go no just walk just leap over the banister <laughs> and and he would go okay put the dog on the sofa let the dog uh, you know and have a pile of laundry sitting over here and and okay when you know we do a kitchen scene let's do some dishes so i you know it sounds crazy now but that that was all very revolutionary in presenting an american family in 1960 that really you know, people related to, and they go, that's, that's really much more like us. Mm -hmm. Look like yeah. their house with the laundry everywhere. Yeah. Nobody, uh, nobody doing the vacuum in pearls. But he wore <laughs> pearls. Yeah. I mean, that was the interesting thing about Leave it to Beaver was like the one female character who was strong and smart and funny was June, but pretty much every other female that they bring in is, you know, kind of a trip. And, and your show kind of like, as the years go on, you sort of you start casting women, you know, Tina Cole comes in and then Beverly Garland comes in and then she has a daughter and stuff. So how was that on the set for you guys? Was that fun? It, yeah, it changed, you know, the tone, but it seemed to be a progression of life. You know, we were getting older and I guess they figured, hey, we better get some girls around here. <laughs> you know, it was kind of even worse on Bonanza. Those guys were already grown and there weren't any women. <laughs> so, yeah, I think they thought we got to get some women in here. Don was the oldest, so he was the first to get picked off by Tina Cole and married her and then they thought well what about fred mcmurray he's never been married so they brought <laughs> beverly garland he got married to beverly garland who had a little girl uh finally i met polly and if we'd gone another year probably barry would have been married off. i mean no, they were I marrying married you tramp. guys off was, yeah was, tramp. <laughs> they, they were married forever hooked to tramp is I that tramp in back of you in that photograph that's tramp it isn't is, it yes. yeah. it's the only kind of picture that i have of me and my three sons but it's tramp oh it like a, man oh that's so cute times bigger than i was licking in the back in the day the the trainers would put a little butter behind your ear to make the dog jump up and look like he's giving you a big loving kiss but he was actually just uh flipping flipping 
licking I mean, butter off or baby food or something. <laughs> to, but, you know, the other iron, iron, the thing that introducing women to continue with that theme into the show, mm-hmm. it it presented new issues of when Don got married and, and to Tina on the show. Uh, you know, they never had to encounter what is it like to have two young people married commingling you know in the same bedroom and and the start of season six or whatever it was where tina came on uh they had the bedroom set up don and tina's uh you know a bedroom robbie and katie's bedroom with twin beds oh and wow. don came in and said oh come on now let's let's i get it it's the censors they don't want any kind of ins- in, yeah. insinuating we might be having sex here but this is this is outrageous how can and you he- have three babies yeah. with two beds <laughs> yeah so anyway, they 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 did a little research, and apparently, I think Bewitched might have been the first sitcom that that introduced the idea that a married couple could actually have a king size bed, or probably a queen size, or whatever it was. But the but the rule was, according to the censors, is that only one person can be under the covers. If they're both in the bed, you know, one has to be outside the covers. One can be under the covers, oh, wow. and and the person outside the covers has to have their foot on the ground. So okay. it made sex kind of very difficult, but they they somehow worked it out. That was the know. motion picture code too, right? I mean, it was the same. Uh, yeah, they had the Hayes code back yeah, the in the Hayes day. Code. No, they were, they were struggling with the censors. But I I, was, I always thought that was brave of Don to just go, okay, come on, guys, let's let's do a reality check here. Now I know we don't want to don't want to offend anybody in the Midwest. Don't want you know, but let's have a little bit of nod towards the what real couples are like in America these days, young people. So yeah, very. I have a special affinity for men with corrective eyewear because uh-huh. my glasses are my only distinguishing physical characteristic. <laughs> and you were cast in 1958 in a Paul Newman movie called right. Rally Around the Flag Boys, but ended up not doing it. And why was that? Well, again, just to decide to Stan was in that movie first. He, <laughs> he was cast as the other son. We were both cast as uh, Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward's kids. Uh, and in fact, um, I was on the set filming a scene. Paul Newman's our dad walking in the door. This is what the scene was wanted us to do. And, and Stan and I were supposed to be on the t- on the sofa watching TV, big old boxy kind of gigantic television, you know, of the era. Anyway, the director was a guy named Leo McCary, who had directed Duck Soup, uh, you know, wow. like a real old timer. And, uh, and that, by that, I mean a screamer, you know, <laughs> when things would go wrong, it'd blow his top. And so anyway... I'm looking at the TV. They go, you know, Paul comes in the door. Hi, kids. And we're not supposed to look, pay him any attention. Just focus on the TV. Well, my eyes to the camera look like I was looking off to the left instead of straight at the TV. So McCary goes, Scott, Barry, you know, look at the TV. I told you, look at that darn TV. Don't take your eyes off that TV. Let's do it again. Okay, action. Paul comes in. Hi, kids. And, you know, Scott, Barry, you're not looking at the TV. What the hell's wrong with it? Uh, three or four more times. Newman finally intervened, you know, God bless him, said, hey, take it easy. You know, you got the shot. You got this me established walking in the door, right? Now let's do a close up of just the kids looking at the TV. And he got inside the empty box they had as a TV, literally crawled in it. You know, it was big enough in those days with a puppet and was waving at me. And, and you know, I, to get my attention because he thought I was just, just you know, distracted. And it still wasn't working. And then, so they... <laughs> They said, "Uh oh, some there was this whispery kind of confab going on, going, oh, oh, yeah, I don't know." And they, go, and they go, "I think he's having a seizure or something." And they, so they, they literally took me from the set to a hospital. What? And they diagnosed me uh, as having an astigmatism because I, I wasn't wearing glasses at the time. Okay. Came back to the set, whatever it was, two, three days later, and the doctor said he needs glasses. He has an astigmatism. He needs, and so uh, I was unceremoniously. Uh, escorted off the lot. I was fired from my very first job because they said, well, we don't see Paul Newman's son having, you know, it was enough that I had a, you know, a bowl cut like Mo Howard and Buck Teeth. <laughs> and now he's got glasses. Okay. That's, that's it. We got a recast and, uh, and I was let go from, and I was, I'm still in the movie in a very, very first scene that you see me, I'm upside down, literally upside down that uh, Percy Kilbride who was a character actor of the day in it. And Joe and Woodward had me by my feet and they're swinging me back and forth because I swallowed some coins. Well, that's me. <laughs> but in the rest of the movie, it's, it's, it's another kid. All right. So that you got your stuff. You stunk suffered credit. the humiliation that all kids with glasses suffered, but you did it in a grander scale. 
I did. Yes, I love that. Yeah, story. but that that opened the door for him because every kid back in those days kind of looked like me. They had that blonde Aryan kind yep. of look, and mm-hmm. you know, after that, Barry got glasses, and everybody wanted him too. You know, because he had a different look, and he, yeah, he's cute as a bug. Oh, the yeah. glasses and the buck teeth and, and the, the Mr. Moto look or whatever that was. And it worked great. The kid could great. act, no, it, too. It was a prototype nerd, and uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> proud of that, actually. So I have a question for you guys, having grown up in the business. Is it difficult to transition from the adorably precocious delivery of a child actor to the maturity and diversity required of an adult actor? Was there a period where you just really didn't even know what, what was expected of you on the set as, an, as now suddenly an adult? Well, I, it's hard I, to make that transition yeah. out of out of our era. Barry's like a miracle. <laughs> you know, I had the fortitude and, uh, you know, just kept pushing till he finally found work again and his look changed. But for most kids out of our era, the, the casting people didn't even want to see you after a show was over. They thought you were typecast. And that was pretty much the nail in the coffin of, of a lot of actors unless you reinvented yourself. But there, there are so few that you can point to. Uh, Barry's one of the ones that you can point to and said, hey, he went on successfully. I, I, I went behind that. the camera. I, I thought it was better for me to go behind. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I was prepped pretty early on for for <laughs> impending doom once the show went off the air by my parents, who really were very insistent on getting an education, making sure if you're going to be an actor, you got to study, you got to work hard, you got to don't expect it to be just handed it to you like a like a young you know child actor gets a lot of times. So I, uh, you know, I went to, uh, did, you know, I studied immediately. I went off and went to New York and worked in, in New York and studied in New York and worked with some acting coaches out here uh, at the actor studio and uh, the actors and directors lab. And, and I was lucky enough to kind of get some breaks right out the shoot. And uh, so, you know, yeah, it, 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 it was important to, to have my head straight when I came off the show to, to not, not rely on your cuteness because that certainly wasn't that cute kid that I was when I, I went I was done when I was 18 so I didn't clearly was not 10 12 years old anymore and uh and you know and uh I kept at it and you know uh it was a challenge but I I you know it's a challenge today so nothing's changed I, I've asked this of every person who had early success in their life is there a part of you uh because you had to do these long days and be taken away from your friends when you in any way regretted uh, missing a normal childhood to do all your hard work at the studio? Not, not really. Um, you know, as best we could, we actually did have a, a normal childhood. Of course, we worked on the set for, you know, 10 hours a day, came home. And, uh, you know, my parents were smart. They bought a house by a park. So when we got home, they didn't have to go drive us somewhere and go meet our friends. We literally could climb over the fence and till it got dark, we'd be playing baseball or whatever, you know, we were into in those days. And we had all our childhood friends, you know, non-showbiz friends. So I think that kind of helped us ground. A lot of kids uh, that I knew grew up that were on TV, went to Hollywood professional school. So they were pretty much with their own ilk three hours a day and my parents go well we don't really want you to do that because uh you're gonna live with real people (laughs) normal people you might get a big head if you go there uh and yeah i think that was part of the problem for some of those people too is that you come out of there you have this sense of superiority or there's something better about you and unfortunately that breeds a feeling that the business owes you a living just because you were on a show and, you know, we were always of the mind. You had to go out as soon as something was over and you're starting back at square one every time. You know, I had to make a commitment to not, to not fall in that trap. I mean, I, I bristled at that concept of there's no future for you because there was, there was many guys that I knew that were my peers that, you know, wanted to uh, identify as some sort of damaged goods and this is it. And it's, you've been, you know, the mark of Cain now is, the big S for, you know, or C for child actor is on your forehead. And I, I just, I just couldn't swallow that. And I, I got into a, a mindset that I want, I, I don't, I don't accept that. And, and it was, you know, maybe a challenge for me to prove everyone wrong that I, I, you know, that I, I wanted to persevere and I had encouragement for some people that I, they felt I had talent. So um, that was, that was all motivating me to push forward and yeah, still have a pretty good career today. So what was the first job that you landed that had no kind of like uh, acquaintance with 
or resemblance to the way you looked as Ernie Douglas? I did. Uh, I did a a Hallmark Hall of Fame did a uh, a television version of the Broadway musical "You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown," and I played Linus. So I had <laughs> to uh, sing and dance and had a solo. My blanket with and me and uh, you know play a character of a twelve year old little guy with his pals. Uh, you know, wasn't this? This was not. Uh, you know, death of a salesman by any means, but it was certainly a <laughs> departure from anything that I'd ever done before. And it was uh, exciting and a challenge to do, to fit into an ensemble. And, you know, like I said, a thing and dance, uh, which, 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 which was a great challenge, but I, it was a lot of fun. All right, I knew Barry nailed it. Uh, he did a play down at the Amundsen called Cause Celeb. And so I went to a matinee to see him. And um, watching the play, watching, I kept thinking, when is my brother going to show up in this thing? <laughs> <laughs> he hadn't shown up yet. And it wasn't until a few minutes later, one of the people I was watching on stage, I suddenly realized was my brother. He had completely lost whatever earniness that he had wow. and had, you know, created this character that was so different than who he was that I, I mean, I was blown away. You know, I, I, I knew he had it at that point. I was very British, and I was very gay. So, uh, <laughs> yes, it was a little another departure from from the realm of Ernie. Uh, but what a what a great time, and what a you know, it was it was lovely to do something that that far out and different. It was it was really a blast. Uh, are you guys ready to play some My Three Sons trivia? And I I just want to tell you the rules up front. If you guys give Fritz a moment to answer, because you might know, you guys might know the answers. Having okay. been, I never the watched show. the show. Yeah, so I don't know if I'll. You may work. not. You may not know the answers, but let's. Give, <laughs> and I'm elderly, so I'm working at. Let's a give Fritz a moment, and then, All right. and we'll see how we do. Okay, now, question number one: My Three Sons is the second longest running sitcom in history. Which show is in first place? Does The Simpsons count? No. Should we give him a hint? Yeah, yeah give him a hint. You were also on that show. Yes, that's an excellent hint. Dick Van Dyke. No, what show were they on? We didn't before? talk about Dick Van Dyke. They were both on the Dick Van Dyke show, weren't you? Didn't you both make appearances? I, on I was. I, I did. Episode. Okay. No, I really. One of show. the sons on the show played uh, guitar. I'm a traveling a man. Oh, Rick, the, the the Nelsons. Yeah. Yeah. Ozzie and Harriet. Okay. Yeah, I think that, I think that record no longer stands. I, I I wish it were true, but I believe that Nash. Which oh. you know, hard to, that was a comedy, and it was a half hour, and I guess you kind of you'd have to. I think it was called okay. a sitcom. All right, and The Simpsons. I think Fritz is right. The yep. Simpsons is clearly the champ now, so I think they need to go back and rewrite that. Uh, yeah, for, forever. If like, animation like, counts yeah, but they're as a not sitcom, real people they're just a bunch of cartoons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, tell me about Ozzy and Harriet. How was that? I mean, was Ricky Nelson because he was already an iconic rock and roll star, like a pain in the neck? <laughs> no, not at all. No, the entire family was great. Yeah. Most they down to earth, like sweetest, kindest. Ozzy was uh, was just the best, and and I, I'd say I got my first acting lesson from Ozzy, because Ozzy did everything on the show. You know, he wrote it, he directed it, he produced it, and he starred in it. And the last thing that he really ever wanted, he was concerned about, was his performance. And so he had a teleprompter off stage. But anyway, he would go, you know, uh, Barry, you know, I think I was doing the first time I did an episode, I was given a bowl of chocolate ice cream and it was in the kitchen and we're talking and I just, just was shoveling it in, just shoveling it in. And I had dialogue and it kind of came and went and I just got into that ice cream. It was so good. And so was, he said, Barry cut. He says, okay, now I want you to do this is whenever somebody's talking, all you got to do is just lo look at the person who's talking and then I've already given you the line, but you got to listen to what they're saying. So listen to what that person's saying and then just say what I have to say and then go back and do what you got to do. <laughs> so, you know, that's acting 101 is just listen, respond. Yeah. You know, keep it simple. And uh, and, and it, it works. And uh, but they were it's very they, Pavlovian. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a teleprompter actor. He did. He, he, oh, God. Yeah. You know, yeah, I, no. I did. Uh, and this is one of the greatest moments in television history. I did a Perry Mason episode and I was a murder suspect in the murder of Regis Philbin. Re, ah. re, re, Regis Philbin <laughs> was um, 
It was called the tale, the tale of the Telltale Talk Show host, okay, wow. and I was part of an irritating morning team with my cohort Fred Rogan from Channel Four. This was stunt casting because That's Perry Mason funny. had just moved over to I NBC. I thought you were going to say this was typecasting. Oh no, no, no! <laughs> it, it, it easily could have been, but. Um, but I mean, and some of the other Fred and I were the irritating morning team. Montel Williams was the uh, was the uh, sports host. Christina Ferrari was the women's issues wow. host in the middle of the day, and Mariette Hartley was the radio psychologist. And wow. all of us, at one time or another, were suspected of having killed Regis Philman, who was the general manager of the station. Well, this was at a time in in uh, Raymond Burr's life. He was ill. He had kidney cancer or something, and he was really suffering. So he would not act with other actors. Mm -hmm. But he he was so skilled. We would all we would all do our scenes, and then they would bring Raymond out of his trailer, and uh, you know nurses had to be there with him, and he would do these astonishing scenes that, where he used the teleprompter as the other character, yep. and you yep. could not tell that this man was not talking to another human being. He would even do the back and forth thing with his eyes, like he was having eye contact with the other actor, and it was brilliant. He was he had it yep. down to a, an art form. Well, I did it too with him, but I didn't do. I did an Ironside episode. Oh, there and, we go. And, and Raymond, you know, had the teleprompter. I don't know if this is before the episode you did or after. Uh, this was this was after my three sons, uh, and I was playing some sort of you know suspect in a murder. Um, but yeah, you know, he he read off the teleprompter. The only other person I'd ever seen do that was Ozzy Nelson, and just made it look like the real deal. I, I had so much respect for him after yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, he was. It, you know, he didn't get out of the wheelchair. He never, he never no. walked, and he never had to remember anything. No. He just uh, showed up, read his lines, and uh, what a gig! I'd like to remind like you that we are playing my three. I know. Well, trivia. don't. Can you ask somebody else a question because right. I've already embarrassed myself? Stan, since you never watched the show, <laughs> uh, question number two: Fred McMurray approved the casting of the kids. Who did he eliminate from the running? <laughs> Probably lots of people. Uh, yeah, there were a couple. Like Fritz. Oh, I was out of there. All right, so it's a famous person. I'll give you a hint. Who went on to star in a program called Peyton Place? You Ryan O'Neill. Yeah, I know that. Can I? I know it. Oh, okay. I should have gone to you next. Barry. I was so happy to have it. I blurted it out. I'm sorry, Barry. Uh, oh well, it was Ryan O'Neill. Yeah, and he was. Ryan O'Neill was uh, cast originally in the Don Grady's roles, Robbie, and then. Uh, but there was a few other kids too. Bobby Diamond, who was the kid on Fury. You know, now we're going way back and digging quite deep. But Bobby Diamond was, was I think another person who might have gotten cast or certainly got close, and they and they decided he wasn't right for it. Uh, Stan was the first person. Did we already say this? He was the first person cast in My Three Sons, other than Fred McMurray. And how did he make the judgment, uh, uh, Stan? Did he he have to work with you a little bit and see what the chemistry was, or? Well, I think the producers, um, you know, he, he was probably relying on them for that mm -hmm. or even the casting person. What had happened before My Three Sons, just prior to that, I had done a TV pilot for Jackie Cooper uh, called Skippy. And Skippy is what got me all my work. Uh, my parents would rent a theater and invite producers who wanted to see me actually work. You know, it's one thing to go in and read. It's another if you got yourself on film. And I starred in this TV series that never was picked up, but it was a, a heck of a, you know, audition piece, let's wow. put it that way. And, uh, you know, people seeing that uh, gave me a break, you know, said, wow, he's good. Let's get him. Jack, Jackie Cooper was a very, you know, there, there's another example of a child actor who went on to have a, a fantastic adult career. Some of it in front of the camera. He actually he did a lot, but he was also a producer director, and uh, you know he he did quite well uh, post his child actor days. And Skippy, in fact, was a movie he did as a child actor, wasn't it, Stan? Was it? Didn't yeah, nineteen thirty four, I think it was. He played Skippy in this movie, and um, he was nominated for an Academy Award. He was actually the youngest child actor nominated for an Academy Award uh, until they did Kramer versus Kramer. And, and he went on to be a great child advocate in show business, right? Was he the one that... That uh, was Jackie Coogan. That was Jackie, Jackie Coogan. Sorry. Coogan. Oops, yeah, the sorry. Coogan Law is named after him because mm -hmm. he lost all of his money. Uh, you know, that now the Coogan Law established that, that uh, a certain percentage of a child actor's paycheck has to be put into a, a court trust that they can... That only they can access when they're 18 years old. Uh, mm. So... Yeah, that was Coogan, not Cooper. But Coop, Cooper was a great child act. They both were, actually. Yeah. 
Well, we have trivia question number three. I think Fritz is going to like the answer to this one. <laughs> How did William Frawley use Barry and Stan to seek revenge against former I Love Lucy co-star and arch frenemy Vivian Vance? You guys want to tell the story? Dan, you, you, you were there. Yeah, you know. uh, well, yeah, Bill had an ongoing feud going with Vivian Vance, <laughs> and uh, they would pull different pranks on us. So one day he engaged me to help him out. I think Barry was there that day, and our, our task was to go across the street where the editorial department was and get maybe 20 or 30 empty film tins, and they're pretty big. Uh, and uh, if you let them drop on the ground they make a heck of a racket so we put them all in a box we paraded on to the next uh, stage we were on stage 11 uh the lucy show was on stage 12 and we brought this box of uh film tins in there and we waited until we heard uh lucy uh, not lucy but vivian's voice and then bill gave us the order to throw the box and let the tins go so these things started clanging and clattering and rolling all over the place and <laughs> You know, that was his revenge. And we heard a voice off in the background yell, Bill! <laughs> <laughs> she knew exactly who it was. Wow. Of course, we were his minions. He could have probably blamed us for it and did. But uh, <laughs> yeah, he he was total prankster and fun. And I mean, most of the fun of working with Bill Frawley was never knowing uh, what was going to come out of his mouth. He was very creative with four-letter words. Uh, if he didn't like a scene, he would berate the author in the most uh, <laughs> uh, graphic way. Let's just put it that way. And yeah, he was so much fun. Great guy. Of all the historic Incredible. shows you guys have worked on, who for each of you has been the most inspirational person, a person that may have changed your life or your perception of the business? Who well, came... I think for me, still, it would be Fred McMurray. I mean, not because of what happened at the time and working with him, but later... As you get older and you're doing this stuff, you look back and you realize what he had done and, you know, how almost impossible that would be to do today. But it was, you know, his flexibility as an actor. Uh, we were talking about that earlier. He yeah. could segue from light comedy into being, you know, a heavy like the Kane Mutiny or uh, you know, Double Indemnity. But at the same time, at the absent mind of Professor, um, some of the other films that he did even back in those days, The Egg and I with Claudette Colbert. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was really a consummate actor. And yeah. it was kind of hurt my feelings later as an, you know, as an adult actor, somebody still involved in the industry looking going, this guy really didn't get a proper credit or his due. You know, he should have had at least a, a Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, and a lot of his work, I think, was, you know, Emmy quality or Academy Award quality. He just seemed to be one of those actors. There was a lot of actors like that at that time that all seemed to get those Lifetime Achievement Awards. And there was just a lot of them in front of Fred, like Henry Fonda and Jimmy Cagney and James Stewart. And they just never got to Fred is, is what happened. Was there something about taking a sitcom that you think, you know, me took him out of the running for that kind of an honor? You know, sitcoms, yeah. I think, still i mean you know they generate you know, emmys and stuff like that but i don't think they were taken as seriously as if you did the dramatic work the dramatic work even in feature films always seems to win out for the awards you know over over comedy yeah you know i i think i read something that jackie gleason said he said you know <clears throat> it's very often you'll see a, a comedic actor or a comedian can do drama but it's very rare that mm -hmm. you see a really good dramatic actor that can jump into comedy mm -hmm. and do a really good co comedic role. It's it's uh, harder than it looks. Yeah, uh, you know. And Fred I, could. Yeah, you know, he was one guy that... Fritz will tell you, comedy is is uh, is you know it has a different kind of way of working, and mm -hmm. and uh, you either have that gift of timing and yeah. uh, or you don't. You know, and, and it's not something you can learn. I've, I've and, seen and it. Gleason was on another level because he hated to rehearse. Yeah. And I, yeah. I I can't imagine doing a network show and uh, uh, how hard it was for the other actors to get used to the fact that the star didn't want to rehearse his lines. And if you yeah. weren't as, you know, as fast as he was, what that put you in? Well, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've watched The Honeymooners probably each episode 40 times. So you can see when he goes up. And Art Carney was brilliant, you know, yeah. as, as good as his as Gleason was and, and Jane Meadows and Audrey Meadows. Um, but anyway, the, you know, you can see when Gleason is stumbling and and, you know, because he didn't rehearse. And uh, 
you know, and Carney is there to pick it up. You can mm-hmm. just see uh, there's a couple, there's a thing on a train where they're at and they're talking about going to a convention and, and Jackie Gleason is humming and hawing and goes, we're going to go, uh, Norton, uh, we're having uh, unbound fun. <laughs> And, and our Cardi looks at him and goes, good, clean fun. <laughs> and he goes, exactly. <laughs> and Get go, me back. Okay. That, was, that was Gleason stumbling, you know, Art Cardi saying the line. And yeah. then Gleason got, exactly. <laughs> like, Unbound fun. Nah, that's not anything that uh, Ralph Cramden would have ever said. <laughs> well, that's I have one, one more trivia question. One of the of getting, getting training as an actor on stage. Because when you're doing a play, I mean, all you're doing is things are going wrong and you're dealing with it. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it teaches you to think on your feet and mm-hmm. how to do things or how to make things sometimes funny and get around the problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Creatively and staying sharp and knowing that you're going to land it somehow, you know, which yep. takes a certain courage. We have one more trivia question that comes with a visual. Do you have that visual, Thomas? Well, he's finding that. Let me ask Barry about one inspirational person you've always reflected on in your show business career. Um, Can well, you pick one out? You know, clearly early on, you know, uh, early on would be probably Fred McMurray and, and Ozzie Nelson. You know, I'm going to go through stages. Uh, a director that I worked with, and I'm, you know, I'm not trying to sound all boasting here, but my work with David Fincher, I had the pleasure of working with him four wow. times, um, uh, you know, in Zodiac and then Social Network and a couple of commercials. And uh, just his method of working, you know, uh, you're going to do an awful lot of takes and you have to give yourself up to that. And uh, and you're never going to look, you know, you're never going to look any better than when you're working with him because he won't let you look bad Mm. and he'll just drag a performance out of you. I mean, he's, you know, it's it's and in the end, I go, well, that was that was inspirational in that his his commitment to quality is is so on on such a high Hmm. level. And um, I, I found that very, uh, very great. Okay, so Notice here comes that. trivia question. Is the performer pictured here with you two and Don Grady? A, Dodie. B, Beverly Garland. Or C, <laughs> co-host of this fine podcast, Louise Blanker. <laughs> well, I'm going to eliminate Dodie and Beverly <laughs> Okay. Garland. So I'm going to say that's you. <laughs> that was me. At a live from Hollywood event, I gave you guys drumsticks that said Premier Radio on them. Wow. Do you still have wow. your drumsticks, Barry? Jeez, I I do, but I, but I'm not, I'm not wearing that toupee anymore that I'm wearing. <laughs> that was, <laughs> wow, that was probably the 80s or 90s. I don't. You can take that off the screen, Thomas. I think we've we've seen yeah. enough of it. But we do look kind of familial, you know, like we like we hang, you know, yeah. usually yeah. in drum the way we do. Stan, you did a movie with one of the great titles of all time, The Attack of the 60-Foot Centerfold. <laughs> yeah. But you also, <laughs> did you act in it and do special effects? Um, yes, actually, I, um, a buddy of mine was doing the special effects for that movie and he got sick as a dog. I don't know what happened to him. And the guy that directed the movie is a friend of mine and said, uh, you think you could do any of these things? Well, there's a billboard in it that she walks by a miniature billboard. And, uh, there was a, a was rocket that fired darts. So <laughs> all these different things I ended up building that, yeah, they used, there was also, I think, a six-foot-long, six-foot by four-foot-wide mousetrap because hmm. they have to yeah, they have to catch this giant mouse that got created out of whatever the vial of solution was that they tested, but uh, a regular mousetrap wouldn't do. So, yeah, I ended up doing special effects for that. I think I did it for another film, too. There was a, I wasn't in it at all, but uh, it was a giant Concorde supersonic jet and uh, they needed it for a, what they call a force perspective shot, where it's like right here in the foreground, and it looks like it's a real jet because it's huge, but it actually was about eight, 10 feet long. And I basically had to make that. Wow. That's cool. You directed and produced the Actors Journey series too. Yeah, that's my, uh, <laughs> well, I wanted to give something back to the industry. Uh, as we all know, you can go to acting schools all over the country. You can go to mom pop schools colleges, universities, Yale, Harvard, and spend anywhere from, you know, a couple thousand bucks on up to a hundred grand to get your uh, acting degree. And you graduate and then you come to the business to work. And the first day there you go, uh, what the hell do I do? They didn't <laughs> teach me that part. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, you know, during the day. I know how to act if I'm on stage or in front of a camera. 
So it always bothered me. There was really no program taught in the at the university level or college level uh, that really taught the business side, the non-performance skills needed. They only teach this, you know, the acting skills. So I put a program together. I involved 100 people from the industry because I didn't want it to be coming for me and I'm teaching this thing. But I brought a group of actors, directors, producers, agents, uh, uh, casting directors. I have the president of the Screen Actors Guild, president of the Directors Guild of America as the people who teach this program. It's a 10 hour long program called The Actor's Journey. And it's literally everything you could possibly ever encounter on the other side of the camera, meaning the business side. Is that available to be viewed on YouTube or anywhere accessible to people that might not be in the it's, business? Yeah. Originally, it was uh, produced and, and distributed through DVD. Um, and right now, we're kind of turning it over so it can be streaming media. So people will be able to access it at theactorsjourney.com, uh, hopefully within the next month. Uh, but all, the, the entire program will be there. Like I said, it's, I think, about 45 of these people that are involved teaching the show had either won or been nominated for uh, Academy Emmy Golden Globe Award. So you're literally getting the information that you need from the horse's mouth, so to speak, because uh, there's a lot of people that supposedly teach business of acting. But, you know, you're looking at, well, this guy's only been in show business for like about a year or two. How, how could they possibly know that? where almost everybody in here has got a 20, 30 year career, been very, very successful. And, you know, they literally can answer your most obscure question about how you go about doing this, you know, what your real job is. I mean, acting is your reward mm -hmm. for doing the job of trying mm -hmm. to get the work. Yeah. Yeah. And not just trying to get the work, but probably also protecting yourself, knowing what your rights are. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because mm -hmm. bad things can happen to you when you don't know what's going on. And, you know, if you're new to the industry, more than likely you don't know anybody that's had a level of success that can impart, you know, a lot of the information. One of the things I found out just in doing it was, like I said, we uh, had a hundred people involved in this and, you know, every person sort of had a part of the puzzle. Not every single person knew everything. So it was interesting to have all of these people give you the sum total of of their knowledge. And, you know, uh, I always like an actors coming to the uh, movie industry and trying to learn what to do is each actor trying to reinvent the wheel, the same wheel. So why not have the wheel just given to you? You can look at it, you know, it takes you 10 hours and you're good to go and not make the mistakes that everybody else made who came before you. I, I love that because there's, so, there's a lot of people who want it so badly that they're willing to make sacrifices in order to, you know, maybe get a, get a part or get cast. And they're not really looking out for their future. They just want what they want right now. Yeah. That's a well, good that, point. That's everybody. And yeah, there are sacrifices to be made, but you need to know which are the ones that are worth making yeah. and other ones aren't because they just lead to a dead end road or a detour or something else, you know. And about that same point, Weezy, my business manager represents a lot of people in the business. And a, a, a large portion of her business is young people. And I think one of the great things that can be taught or warned about is success early and how to manage your money and what to look for, for someone to guard your investments and your guard your fiscal responsibility because she has these nightmare stories about kids. And, and, it, and if their egos have already expanded because they've been kowtowed to on the set, then even their business manager can't give them good uh, tips on uh, how to guard what they have. It's uh, it's a nasty That's thing. true. But, you know, you have to realize the business manager only knows the you know, his point of view of the business from the point of view of a business manager, mm -hmm. just like a director knows it mm -hmm. from a director's point of view and an actor knows it from an actor. And we wanted to provide a plethora of point of views of the same question and how mm -hmm. they all answer different. Uh, in fact, it's funny you brought that up because one of the, the segments in there is called, you know, the troubles with the early success which does happen to people. And it's probably one of the worst things that can happen to you because you have the success before you really learn what to do about the business. And when the show's over, you're like, okay, what do I do next? My, oh, and my agent just dropped me. I don't know why they dropped me. I just had a big hit. Now what? Yeah. What do I do? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. There's so many variables and it's, you know, if, especially if you grow up doing it. And I guess you guys had parents that kind of made sure that by the time you became adults that you understood how to 
take care of yourselves and how to manage your own money and how to uh, make sure that your interests were looked after. Yeah, they looked after us pretty well. Unfortunately, our parents weren't, you know, starstruck and, you know, they weren't in it for themselves. The money that we earned while we worked all those years was set aside uh, for us when we became 18 or 21, whatever it was. Um, yeah, they didn't go running off to Las Vegas with it. So the whole, you know, whatever the earnings mm -hmm. were, were there and it gave us a head start in life. And, you know, if you don't go out and, you know, when you turn 18, buy a Ferrari or yeah. buy a house really? you can't afford, you're in pretty good shape. So a lot of a lot of parents, they want the kids to remain dependent upon them so that even after they turn 18, they'll still need their parents as managers. So they don't teach their kids how to take care of themselves. Yeah, our parents were never officially managers, you know, um, you know, they handled, handled our money fairly well, you know, by not dipping into it. Uh, but by the time I was 17, 18, I had a professional uh, business manager. And fortunately, he wasn't one of the unscrupulous ones. Yeah. He did well by me. And, you know, um, you have Fred I guy. either left out or, you know, was guided well, to the right our, people. Our parents, our parents turned down work uh, often because they wanted us you know, we had um, the shooting schedule for sons was probably seven, eight months of the year. So we had four months. And rather than picking up another job and making more money, uh, they were more concerned with us just, just having a, a time to go back to school and sort of integrating with our peers and learning about the real world. And uh, as adults, that's been that's been a beneficial thing. Uh, it, it shows. You know, yep, you really it really know. does. All right. I think we're ready for our closing credits. We would love for you to join us online on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where we are Media Path Podcast. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. We would love to know what media you've been enjoying. You can contact us at our social media or email us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. We want to thank our guests, Stanley Livingston and Barry Livingston. Our team includes Dina Friedman, Francesco Damanda, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Palanker here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the media path. Take it away, Fritz. If you enjoyed this episode of Media Path, it would help us a great deal uh, to be more discoverable by potential new viewers and listeners if you would leave us a quick review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're new here and this is your first time with us, please check out our back catalog. We have lots of binge-worthy stuff over and above the Brothers Livingston. We have Gary Puckett. We have the Cow we have Henry Winkler. We have Keith Morrison. We have Josh Mankiewicz. We have lots of interesting people uh, that you will hear with great conversation. Thank you so much for spending an hour with us today. And we would be overjoyed if you took just a moment to share your thoughts with us or recommend us to a friend. Be safe. Thanks for listening. It was so great, guys. That was wonderful, guys. So easy and uh, fantastic.